All right, what am I going to talk about today? Rick did something really nice this time. He actually gave me a topic that I know something about. So that's really very useful. Uh, and we're going to talk about challenges. Whoop. I'm sure we've got the correct study here someplace. We're going to talk about the new medical legal risks in emergency medicine. Uh, are they truly new is the first question. Remember, we talked about drugs. They're new. They're better. They're different. Bottom line is this. It is the system we have which is the problem. Those of you who are Canadians don't quite understand that, and those of you who are from other English-speaking countries, you do not have a battle of experts. You know, many years ago I debated a lawyer in Australia about the movement to contingency law in Australia. Fortunately, you avoided that because it's miserable and it's awful, it's lots of things, but contingency must exist based on finding a who? A villain. It's got to find somebody who did wrong. Isn't it true that a lot of stuff happens and remember what they say shit happens? Shit does happen in medicine. And you're going to be there. And I don't call that malpractice. Uh, I call that malocurrence. You're going to be sitting there when something bad comes in, right? Yes, that's what we do. They were bugging me one time from the local newspaper saying, isn't it true, Dr. Henry, that per square foot, your emergency department is the most dangerous place in the county? And I said, that's true. So the next time you're sick, go to Kmart. <laughs> Almost nobody dies in Kmart, except maybe Rolex owners of embarrassment or something like that. <clears throat> But the bottom line is the system is difficult. The beat goes on. And uh, let me just, for a second, point out a paper. Now, this is how you use this book. I expect you're all going to be up each night reading all those articles. And if you do that, you are an idiot. The function of the book is this. When you go back to where your location is and you're having a discussion, then you can pass those things around and say, look, here's the real data right now. Here's what I always do with other specialties, because they get very upset that an emergency doctor wants to tell them about something in their area. Got that going on right now, back in a hospital. I'm going to tell them I'm an emergency doc. What I do is put the papers down and say, you send me your literature. I'm happy to look at your data. And you understand that half the data we get in most things is from their specialists. They don't believe their own stuff. And so that's what this book is for. What I will do is point out some papers for you, though, and, and, and say, put a star after it. This one may be worth reading. Because there are papers are graded. You know, there's great stuff. Most of the stuff gets published as trash, you understand that. It's published for what reason? To build the curriculum vitae of, of, of nitwits, all right? They want to have published something, no matter how bad it is. Now, if there is an area in medicine where the literature is really awful, it's in med legal, right? Because we don't have a nice surrogate marker like a, like a blood pressure or a glucose number, something we can publish, we can hold on to. So what if this is mostly feelings, Mikey likes it. Mikey likes chest pain, Mikey likes this or that, but it's not great science. But there, but there is observational data worthwhile. Brown's paper, number one here, is if you're gonna know what's happening in the country is worthwhile. This is 2010 Academic Emergency Medicine. And they looked at closed claims data. And they used the PIAA, Physician Insurance Association of America. And they cover about maybe 40% of ED visits in the United States. Why don't they have more than that? Because a lot of it's preparatory information. If you're team health, you have your own insurance company. You don't report to anybody. We have no idea what their data says. Well, actually we do, but that's different. Uh, 
but when you put together papers, this is what about 40% of the data says. Number one, misdiagnosis is still important. Misdiagnosis. But it doesn't tell you why it's misdiagnosed. I hate papers that have something in it that say, you ought to have a high index of suspicion for you know, schistosomiasis. Well, that's a bunch of crap. I mean, I'm gonna see, there's thousands of, there's 5,000 diseases listed in Harrison's textbook of medicine. If you take every one of them, am I gonna have a high index of suspicion for 5,000 diseases? No, but in a courtroom, they'll make it sound like that should be the first thing that jumps to your mind, right? That's gotta be it. And it's just crazy stuff. Failure to supervise. How many people work with PAs? Hands up. Let me just tell you, this is the new ripe area. No one has done more cases of emergency medicine malpractice than I have. I, I don't mean I've caused more malpractice than anybody else, but I've certainly reviewed more cases. I've done 2,400 cases since 76. That's a lot of cases. Supervision has gone on a rocket ship ride like this. Why? Because now we're doing more of it. And more than that, people are walking by signing charts and not actually seeing the patients. What constitutes supervision? We haven't had an adequate discussion of this in these United States. We haven't and we're afraid of it. Why are we afraid of that discussion? Give me, give me a good excuse. Well, you're, you're not a local. What's a good excuse? Because we don't want to ask the question we don't want to know the answer to. If you talk to Hans House, in Iowa, half the emergency departments are run by PAs. What's the death rate in Iowa? one per person like everywhere else, okay? It's 100%, but it's no different whether it's run by a doctor or a PA. And they call into the University of Iowa, you know, it, with they need opinions. See, the problem is we don't want that story told. There are all kinds of reasons we don't want that story told, but just remember, supervision is now a problem. 60% um, of the time when we get sued, we don't pay anything. Emergency medicine is actually relatively popular in the United States. No matter what anyone says, I was president of the college when the TV show ER was on. It helped us dramatically in many ways. You became a household word. Uh, and uh, it was very funny because there were all these people who said, well, they shouldn't have called it ER. They should have called it ED, right? Well, the guy who, who won the Emmy for that came to speak at my inauguration. He's an ER doc who actually also went to film school, writes scripts, and he says, how many people in the audience think we should have called it ED? Three quarters of the hands went up. He says, how many people understand we can't have a show that sounds like a talking horse? Uh, and, and he was very funny about the kind of stuff that happens in the business. But just understand that most of the times we do well. You do best if you're sued by yourself because juries relate to people. If they try you, see if they try a hospital, nobody likes hospitals, right? You and I don't like hospitals, all right? We'd screw them just to be doing something. And, and, and uh, a lot of people feel the same way. Doctors do well if sued by themselves. Um, but most of the cases you see are, are predictable by what else we've been doing. By the way, uh, Article 2 talks about kids. We do get sued about kids. Uh, but, but the truth of the matter is the total number of kids that comes through, how many sick kids are there in the country? Not very many. Most of you, when you see kids, you walk in, what's the presumption? They ain't that sick. 
You walk in, and, and my contention is, I'm an old guy. I'm a history and physical guy. Limited tests, simple methods. But in my career, if I've walked in and said, that kid's sick, it's, it's bad, right? If the kid is actually kicking me in the shins, stealing crap out of the drawers, and eats a popsicle, OK, they're not sick. I've never seen one of those kids with meningitis. I never saw it my whole life. The other thing is we are actually treating uh, with immunizations a lot of bad diseases. See, the problem with humans is they have such short memories. I can still remember 1968 when there was diphtheria around, things like that. And you know, if Jenny McCarthy has her way, I guess uh, we'll get to see all those diseases again. But uh, what a nitwit. Uh, you know, that's just, it's morally wrong to proselytize to the country about stuff like that. I don't know what your experience has been, but when I was a medical student, we saw bacterial meningitis once a week in a kid. I haven't seen one now in five years. Why? Because it worked. So the number of really bad kids you get and the number of lawsuits involving kids is down and what you get sued for is follow-up care in those kids' time interval, right? A vomiting 20-year-old can be seen back in 24 hours. A vomiting six or eight month old, that time frame is small. So just understand, what's the single best test of any disease in medicine ever invented? Time and time interval and short-term intermediate follow-up. That's what wins. And pretty much the literature defends that. <clears throat> Question number two, what's ASAP doing to police the quality and veracity of expert witness testimony? Don't get me started. This is an emotional problem with me. We have people who say the damnedest crap you've ever heard in your entire life. But the good news is this, most of this problem is ours. And that has to do with no plaintiff attorney gets to testify. He must have an expert. And you need to do something about this. You need to do something about it, and we have. Uh, I've got the latest data is that uh, at least 34, now it's 36, complaints have gone to the board. The Ethics Committee has looked at them. We've actually sent letters of censure to people saying that their testimony is egregious. If you have a lawyer who doesn't check that database, he's committed legal malpractice. Because believe me, if you go to the stand and they ask you a question like, Doctor, isn't it true your own organization sent you a letter saying that your testimony was egregious in the original Greek sense of that term? How many of you speak reasonable Greek? But it means away from the herd. That's what the term means, apart from the herd. We've taken care of people, and we actually had one guy who the stuff was so bad and I've opposed him on many cases, we tossed him right out of the college and published it. We published his, his uh, being drummed out of the organization in the, in, the, uh, in the monthly newsletter. So it can happen, but you've gotta be aggressive about it. Three, <coughs> who sets the standard of care? We do not, in emergency medicine, function under You'll have to excuse me one second. My, uh, I'm just getting over something. It's amazing coming out here to California. You realize in Michigan where I am, there's still ice on the Great Lakes. We had trouble getting over to Mackinac Island just last week because of the ice flows. They've got uh, Canadian and U.S. Uh, Coast Guard cutters moving up, uh, cutting it. Now they come here, nice weather, I get sick. You know, it's just, it's not right. In any event, standard of care. That's what's tried in, U in the U.S. court system, standard of care. Well, where do we get that from? <clears throat> from expert testimony, 
But we all know that people can say funky things. There is something called a Daubert challenge. Daubert has been adapted by the federal court system. Most states have, ad have adopted Daubert. That means if you're telling funky stories as an expert, we get to challenge the scientific validity, and that's happening more and more and more. Um, and, and so uh, I always loved these guys who had grand rounds. They could have diagnosed anything, couldn't they? How many people honestly think if you saw an early case of anthrax today in your department, you'd pick it up? Well, they're coughing. I'm coughing right now. Do I have anthrax? What? Maybe. Yeah, but maybe monkeys are going to fly out of my ass, too. It's about that statistical probability that I've got anthrax. Now, I could have something else, but that's not what I've got. Um, can the guidelines, question four, can the guidelines of a professional society independently set the standard of care? No, they cannot in court, but these things get put in front of me all the time. Well, this is the ASAP guideline on headache. This is, that's why when we write these things down, let me tell you the problem with every specialty and writing guidelines. Who writes them for the society? Those people who specialize in that area, right? Mm -hmm. That's why they ask them to do it. They, by definition, have a bias when they go in. That's, that's sort of the rule. That's not what the average doctor in the average location does under like or similar circumstances. So that's why, <clears throat> if you haven't followed the fight about TPA, the college's TPA guideline, the fight that went on, Dr. Hoffman's answer to that fight, all this stuff going back and forth, this was a huge problem. And, and we turned right back around on our own college and said, pull it off the table and let's rethink this. Because the last thing you want is some jerk face putting that down in front of you as the expert. Saying, well, your own organization says X, Y, or Z. You don't want that. Um, guy called me up one time and said, uh, I've got this disc, it's got, for all 24 specialties, it's got all their guidelines. Would you like to buy one? Because he knew I did a lot of medical legal work. And I said, no. I said, does any buy, anybody buy these? He says, yeah, lawyers. And he said, no doctors buy it. Because what do most doctors think about guidelines? The shit, right, exactly. They don't care. See, it's not that they're really angry about guidelines. Most of them don't even know they exist. Uh, and have they ever looked at it? Not really. And yet to a group of uh, uh, jurors, that always looks funny when we say, nah, we don't care about stuff like that. <clears throat> uh, there is something, <clears throat> oh, what's new on informed consent? Informed consent versus informed refusal. Emergency medicine is an informed refusal specialty. It's not that we're getting consent. It's do they have the right to refuse care? That's where all the issues are. It's so and so, and we, uh, again, this is a cutting edge update course in, in uh, Prasad versus New York Presbyterian Hospital decided this year you should know about this case. Because uh, this is a guy who was working on a construction project in the city of New York. You know, so uh, forget about it, you know. He falls, he's hurt, he's got blood on his head, he's got this and that, and they're doing a trauma evaluation. Well, the resident, as part of the trauma evaluation, does a rectal exam. Now, we can debate whether rectals are worth it or not. That's a science question. But he said he was doing the standard workup, and this guy had some confusion, some this, some that. This asshole goes and gets the prosecutor in the city of New York to bring criminal actions against this guy on assault. 
Now, the prosecutor knew he was about to step in this huge lake of shit, okay? It was gonna be awful. So he dropped it, but the guy went and did a civil suit, you know, that you violated my civil liberties in this case. Well, that's an interesting question. Because you and I are like fighter pilots. We can be wrong, you can't be in doubt, right? I mean, this isn't, this isn't like a, a breast lump where you can send it around to eight different pathologists and decide what the pathology is. You and I make decisions every day. Well, in Prasad, this went all the way <clears throat> to, the New, to the New York Supreme Court. And what they said was, doctors and EDs are under duress. He had reasonable probability to believe from this fall at a construction site that he may have major trauma. He did, they did not violate this person's civil liberties. So we won that one. You know, and it had to do with competency and it had to do with the situation at the time. Bottom line is this, do what's right. Just do what's right. What would you do for your brother? What would you do for your mother? It's like holding uh, guys who are intoxicated. And, and there's another New York case on that, <clears throat> which has just come out. But the point is, if it was your brother, what would you do? Protect them, right? You'd take care of them. If I ever have to go in front of the jury on holding somebody down, I'll say, yes, ladies and gentlemen, the jury, did I tie them down? Yes, I did for that person what I would do for anyone I cared about. If I'm guilty, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's of loving too much. It's a Hallmark card. A Hallmark. I could be a segment on Oprah, doctors who love too much. You know? It'd be, it'd be great. All right. <clears throat> All right, but it gets murkier. What about... Uh, the, what about other things we put patients through? This is going to become more complex. Do you assume a liability for shooting those x-rays at people? Remember, now we've got Johnny, he's 12. Remember Rick just told you about the Swedish study, that the, Swe the Swedes have universal um, military service. So at 18, they do get that test. There was some indication, as Rick indicated, that there was a decrease in performance. Now, it's, it's relational. You can't show cause and effect on this. But the point is, is there a liability building for you? And there are two recent cases about this, one for you, one against you. One side said, nah. You don't have to inform about this. And the only reason that, that, that one side said you don't have to inform about it was the fact that the temporal distance is so long. Right, if you shoot them with rads, they're not stupid tomorrow, right? How do they catch you? You're retired before they have their, their tumor. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. If you do certain things where immediately there's a bad outcome, everybody understands that. Nobody totally understands yet what our liability is here, but stay tuned that uh, people are working um, on this question. Next, mental capacity. <clears throat> what is the decision, what is the ability to make decisions? Very difficult to decide, but you have criteria, i.e., uh, when you're talking to that patient, can they really process that data and know what you've said to them? Again, a series of cases that look at this, it goes both directions. Uh, by the way, legal responsibility of on-call specialists. There are two papers here, one of which even by a radiologist, oh my God, who says they do have some liability. That is, if you've been consulted about a specific case and you give an opinion, there has been a doctor-patient relationship established. It's like you call up the uh, hematologist and <clears throat> say, look, I got this lady I think has a PE. 
but she's already on Coumadin and she's had this and this and this, what should I do? He does bear some responsibility in this case. They don't get a free ride on the deal, and I think that's important. Um, last thing I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to get out of here, is <coughs> excuse me. The social media. You see this thing? Keep it in your pocket. I was just in a seminar here, up the up the coast. <coughs> Excuse me. Had to do with social media. Two nurses carrying on a conversation on their Facebook page about the handling of a patient. All five of them got fired. Patient found out about it. Now there's a lawsuit against the hospital. <coughs> Excuse me. Two nurses took a picture of an x-ray, foreign body in the rectum, a light bulb. Pretty good picture, eh? I'd want one. You'd want one, sure, of course you would. Shut up. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So what'd they do? They sent it to their 500 BFFs. If you blew that picture up, you can read his name. Very wealthy man. Here's the interesting side effects of this. You know, wealthy men and mistresses, it's a problem in California. Uh, <clears throat> in any event, <laughs> his wife finds out about this. She wants a divorce. That's going to cost him $80 million. He, he sues the hospital for his loss on the divorce. Interesting question, isn't it? as to what you need to do with stuff. <laughs> Third case, guy is, uh, I know, I need to be done. All right, you're all right. Uh, you, you've got the, the thing that comes down. You have a guy who is uh, uh, taking pictures with his phone, okay, of other patients. And the kid comes in who's fallen, gone through a uh, uh, industrial lawnmower. He's snapping pictures that he's now posting, you know, and the management of this kind of stuff. You know what? Just have a sign that says, sorry, no recording, no pictures, no nothing. That's the policy, and most people will follow that policy. But the last thing you want is somebody's individual liberties being violated with that. It's not worth it. Just stop that kind of stuff. It's a very interesting seminar. Uh, because it was pretty much cases all here from Southern California, but they all originated from that one instrument and people doing dumbass crap.